I think we have to ask ourselves, what might be going on in our world, in our life, that we can't yet see? And as individuals, what choices can we make to help put us further on that path to progress and not be so attached to those old ideas and old paradigms? Before we can talk about how social change really happens, we need to understand a little bit about human psychology and society and how that works. Humans are incredibly social creatures. We cling to what we know. We don't like things that challenge our worldview, our identity, or anything that would essentially separate us from our tribe, our family. And that makes us really resistant to new ideas and thinking differently about our own lifestyle choices and what we're doing. And evolutionarily, this actually makes a lot of sense because being part of a tribe has helped us survive at many, many points in history. But today, this clinging to what we know and unwillingness to look critically at ideas often leads to groupthink, and it kind of hinders social change and progress, making it slower than it might otherwise be. All truth passes through three stages. First, it is ridiculed. Second, it is violently opposed. And third, it is accepted as being self-evident. So I want to show you a couple examples of social change and paradigm shifts where the way we viewed things in society dramatically shifted, and then what we can learn from that about the vegan movement today. So the first one that I want to share with you is actually a scientific paradigm. Geocentrism was the first idea that the Earth was actually the center of our solar system, and that was prominent for many, many years. And it was in 1543 when Nicholas Copernicus first suggested, hey, maybe actually the Earth and the planets revolve around the sun, and that was the heliocentric model. And when he first suggested this, he was kind of ignored, laughed at, just not taken very seriously at all. And it was later when Galileo, who we more famously know for promoting this idea, really took it and pushed it in society, trying to convince everyone he knew that no, the sun is the center of the solar system, that huge pushback arose. So he wasn't just ridiculed and ignored at this point. He was put on house arrest, called a heretic, banned from functions, because he was challenging a widely held norm. And yet, by 1686, heliocentrism was the widely established model that everyone accepted. So that took about 140 years. This is Dr. Ignaz Semmelweis, and he was um, a physician in Vienna in the 1840s. And he made an observation where he was working that there was a difference in mortality rates between birthing wards staffed by midwives and those staffed by doctors and that the ones staffed by doctors had a lot more patients dying, and he thought this was very odd. So he made some observations, and he, then he hypothesized that maybe the doctors who were also performing barehanded autopsies might be spreading particles of disease to healthy women that were giving birth. And at this time, the model of how disease was spread was very different. The germ theory was not established, and this was a radical idea. And he was... Uh, so he, he implemented a hand-washing practice and sterilization practice, essentially. Death rates absolutely plummeted in the birthing wards. Not surprising with what we know today. But at the time, doctors, you know, freaked out and felt like they were being uh, considered the problem and that they were to blame for what they were doing. So they fired him. So huge pushback again. And yet, by the late 1800s, germ theory as we know it today, was widely established, and hand-washing is a norm. This one is a social justice issue. So in 1792, Mary Wollstonecraft published The Vindication of Rights of Women. And this is one of the first documents and written works kind of suggesting that women might have rights. But the women's rights movement, especially in the United States, really kind of got going in the 1830s, and then launched even further with the famous Seneca Falls Convention. The comments that women were hearing back then about women's suffrage was incredible. They were ridiculed at first. They were considered silly. Newspapers called the women just a few disappointed women, and 
Um, we need not say that we think the movement excessively silly. They found the declaration of sentiment amusing, and uh, another newspaper said, now it requires no argument to show that this is all wrong. Every true-hearted female will instantly feel that it is unwomanly. But Elizabeth Cady Stanton wrote this a couple years after the convention, reflecting on the change in media attention. Now you seldom take up a paper that has not something to say about women. But the tone is changing. Ridicule is giving way to reason. Our papers begin to see that this is no subject for mirth, but one for serious consideration. We have every reason to look hopefully into the future. So even in the midst of the movement, many of the women were able to recognize how the media started treating them differently. But as the movement grew, so did the heavy pushback and opposition again. And it wasn't actually until 1911 that the National Association Opposed to Women's Suffrage was founded. It was, that's pretty late in the game, right? Like, 1911, when people were so worried about the change they were seeing and so threatened by the progress the women's suffrage movement was making, they founded an association opposed to it and distributed these flyers, giving point-by-point -point reasons as to why you should vote against women's suffrage. And what's really fascinating is also in 1911, California introduced Proposition 4, which was a vote for women's suffrage just at the state level. Some of the legislators who voted against it, and it failed in 1911, actually went on the record saying things like, women's suffrage has proven a failure in states that have tried it. Suffrage is a right, is not a right, it is a privilege. Statistics go to show that most equal suffrage states, divorces have greatly increased. It has been a home destroyer. Crime has increased due to lack of mothers in the home. And yet, just nine years later, the 19th Amendment was passed, legalizing women's suffrage. So that took about 100 years from when the movement really started getting going to becoming a legal reality. The Tuskegee experiment is a little bit different. So this was a study that the, the Tuskegee Institute in Tennessee was putting on, where they wanted to see what happened when African-American men that had syphilis went untreated. And they went out of their way to deny these men treatment, block them from seeking uh, doctors in different states, and this went on into the 1960s. But what's really fascinating is that when one public health official came out and objected to this, the CDC defended the experiments and saying that comparisons to the Nazi experiments were offensive. But then this broke into the media and the experiments ended quite quickly after that um, in 1972. But the thing I really want to share with you is a quote from the study director. In 1976, four years after this study had ended, he was still saying this. The men's status did not warrant ethical debate. They were subjects, not patients. Clinical material, not sick people. So when we look at all of these different trends and how social change has happened, and the fact that people seem so resistant to questioning their own biases and their own actions, I think we have to ask ourselves, what might be going on in our world, in our life, that we can't yet see? And as individuals, what choices can we make to help put us further on that path to progress and not be so attached to those old ideas and old paradigms? And I believe that's the vegan movement today. Although ideas about not eating and using animals and compassion for others have been around for centuries, the word vegan was coined in 1944 in the United Kingdom, and that's sort of what really launched the modern day vegan movement. So the first vegan society was founded in 1944, and one of the vice presidents of the vegan society a couple years later wrote this. The object of the society shall be to end the exploitation of animals by humans, and the word vegan shall mean the doctrine that man should live without exploiting animals. So this is the first time that veganism as a concept about not using and exploiting others is really clearly established and defined. But at first, early vegans were ridiculed. The newspapers said things like, the prospect of a meat famine has given a new impetus to the vegetarian cult. And it would be unwise for the average man to carry out experiments with vegetarian diets to the extreme. 
Harry Harlow is a famous psychologist known for doing some of the most atrocious animal experiments with monkeys. And he said this in 1974, the only thing I care about is whether the monkeys can turn out a property I can publish. I don't have any love for them, never have, don't really like animals, despise cats, I hate dogs, how could you like a monkey? So what this statement shows, again, is that consideration for animals was just not taken seriously. But this ridicule has now given way to something new, heavy opposition and pushback that really shows we've moved into a new stage with the vegan movement. And this is pushback like Italian lawmakers two years ago tried to criminalize raising vegan children something that I have personal experience growing up vegan. Uh, the FBI sent agents out a couple years ago to hunt for two pigs that were rescued, or in their eyes, stolen from a factory farm. And they went around traumatizing sanctuaries and um, vegan activists, taking pieces of flesh to test DNA of various rescued pigs to see if they were these two stolen pigs. The FBI, that's what they're sending the FBI to spend their time doing, which is clearly a scare tactic. So there's a lot of efforts in Congress and at the state level right now to make it illegal to call almond milk milk or plant-based meats meat and define these products as coming exclusively from exploited and slaughtered animals. And that shows, again, the industry is really scared. They're kind of getting desperate because they can see that the tides are turning. There's marches now, animal research saves lives. People feel so threatened, there's been so much attention given to the harms and unnecessary uh, uses of animals in research that they're having marches to defend it now. And this is the one last one I wanna touch on here. This is an ad uh, KFC put out just a month or so ago that is really, just tells you where the times are. So they, the, the ad in a magazine says, try one before you turn vegan. And the fine print on the ad actually says, let's be frank, we've timed this burger badly. It's coming out during a time when unprecedented numbers of people are eschewing meat. And there's every chance that you yourself, if not already vegan, are seriously considering it. It might be the worst possible point in history to launch this burger, but bad timing never tasted so good. So they're putting this out. That shows how defensive they are and how much heavy pushback we're facing now because veganism is being taken so much more seriously. But the tides really are shifting because all of this pushback is a response to the incredible growth in the vegan movement and the positive changes we are seeing. Forbes running a headline, everything is ready to make 2019 the year of the vegan. Are you? Vegan diets are exploding. A report from the food industry found that from 2014 to 2016, the percentage of people identifying as vegan increased 600% from 1% of the population to 6% of the population. CNN is running headlines based on the research coming out about the environmental impact of animal agriculture saying, go vegan, save the planet. CNN headline. And although we've had evidence for many years about the health benefits of a plant-based diet, the environmental devastation of animal agriculture, we now have new studies. And one of the most comprehensive studies ever was published last year in Science, a scientific journal. And The Guardian covered this with a headline saying avoiding meat and dairy is the single biggest thing you can do to lower your impact on the earth. A tech startup in New York City actually banned meat and got media coverage for it due to the environmental impact. They said, we are a sustainable company. We can't serve meat at any of our functions because this, this doesn't fit with sustainability. Uh, <laughs> The uh, previous energy sec secretary, Stephen Chua, has been quoted in Forbes as saying, meat and agriculture are worse for climate change than power generation. And this one is really recent. Some of you might have heard about this. Beyond Meat, it's one of the first vegan food companies to go public, and they had one of the biggest initial public offerings in like the last eight years, I think, for a company this size. And the stocks have gone up about six or seven hundred percent from the day that they launched. 
And part of why this is so incredible and so powerful is because social change research really suggests that it only takes about 10 to 25 percent of the population to strongly hold a value and, and idea for it to radically transform society, reach a tipping point where everyone else who's kind of more the followers and not really questioning things adopts that same ideology. And this is what led the anthropologist Margaret Mead to say, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. And paradigm shifts historically took between 50 to 150 years. And if we see the vegan movement as having started in 1944, we're not even to that 100-year mark. And yet, from a word being coined in an attic in the UK with six people to being something that nearly the entire world has heard of and knows about with billion-dollar food companies and news headlines covering this, that is absolutely incredible and suggests that we may be way closer to reaching this tipping point than anyone can even realize. So I truly believe that we will reach a vegan world in my lifetime. I really, truly believe that. And Donald Watson said, can time ever be ripe for any reform unless it is ripened by human determination? Did Wilberforce wait for the ripening of time before he commenced his fight against slavery? Did Edwin Chadwick, Lord Shaftesbury, and Charles Kingsley wait for such a non-existent moment before trying to convince the great dead weight of public opinion that clean water and bathrooms would be an improvement? So we can't just sit back and expect this change to happen either. We have to help it happen. And you are already doing that by sitting here today, learning about this movement, joining this movement. And the most powerful thing that I think veganism can do is it allows each one of us to stand up and be an example and set that example for everyone around us, saying a different world is possible. So I invite you to join me in changing the world. I'm glad you're here. I hope if you are not already vegan that you begin transitioning that way. Thank you.